Welcomes and greetings to and from the Art of Dreaming here on Revolution Radio University, where today's class is going to be about C. Wright Mill's book, The Power Elite. Class held by yours truly, the host with the most, the voice in constant in freedom of choice, the mind let loose in time travel rewind, the consciousness broadcasting from a remote and secure location somewhere in the fluoride side of Portland. Yes, it is I, Michael Hemmingson, a.k.a. Doc H., Dr. Hemmingson, Wharf Poe, Heavy Mass Object, etc., etc. But really, haven't you been searching for me without knowing it? Following oblique references in crudely Xerox marginal Samistat publications, crackpot mystical pamphlets, and mail order courses, a paper trail and a coded series of rumors spread at street level, and the propagation of certain acts of insurrection against the planetary work machine and the consensus reality, or perhaps through various obscure mimeographed technical papers on the edges of chaos science, through pirated computer networks, or even through pure synchronicity and the pursuit of dreams. You have Googled me, fingered me, tracked me through a maze of digital rumors and innuendo, you have called me a loose cannon in the truth or bowel movement. You have freed yourself from mind control and fear porn and found yourself here in this separate reality of online radio to come to this class. And so broadcasting from another universe, connecting to this universe from the filaments of the multi-maxiverse, we begin with the art of dreaming here at Revolution Radio University. Our class today will be about a very infamous, still used treatise from 1956 called The Power Elite by C. Wright Mills. But before we get into it, uh, a few things about uh, what's going on in the world. Um, you know, uh, there's all this talk about the heavy mass object or something, the nemesis dark dwarf star causing a bunch of earthquakes and uproar either today or tomorrow, uh, you know, uh, propagated by Terrell and others. And, uh, well, there are some, some earthquakes going on. There was a 6.2 uh, followed by a bunch of uh, 4.8s, 4.6s, 4.2s down in the Gulf of California and Baja. Uh, numerous smaller quakes in the Imperial Valley, Brawley, Mexicali area where there was a hundred plus last month, as you remember, in the last few days, there's been a lot. Uh, in the last four days, there's been an extraordinary amount in the Virgin Islands area. So uh, before we could say, uh, hey, Terrell 03, uh, why didn't it happen this time again? Uh, there's things going on and, and they still have another day. Uh, we'll just have to sit and wait and see what, what happens. But aside from all that stuff, um, there's things going on leading to uh, what, uh, you know, people have been talking about the economic collapse and uh, uh, the Third World War. Uh, reports are coming in of a big bomb blast in Damascus being caused by the uh, Syrian rebel forces, which, of course, are being uh, funded and weaponized by uh, the United States and, and uh and the, uh, what should we call the Zionist cabal, I suppose. Um, that's going on. Uh, apparently, uh, France is moving in to um, West Africa for what they call Operation Sabre uh, to rescue apparently some of their uh, people who are are being held by an Islamic terrorist group. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that more at length uh, and during Weird News. But there's that. I and mean, also in, in Europe, we have over in sp Spain and Greece um, a lot of uh, uh, protests, if not full-out riots, over uh, uh, the economic situation there. Uh, we have people who had once good jobs are rummaging through trash cans for a daily meal. Um, the Spain is going to need to be uh, go to the European Union and and, and get uh, bailed out 
um, probably Greece as well, Italy. Uh, we're, we're, we're seeing the closing economic collapse of the, the euro. And as, as many out there say that once the euro collapses, the dollar will probably collapse in about two weeks after that. So what we're seeing in Europe, we maybe start seeing in the United States, especially if we do have an economic collapse and uh, other other issues. You know, I uh, many of you out there know that for for several years I've been tracking the uh, Chinese military on the border of Mexico, uh, speculating any number of reasons why they might be there. And I was uh, out there last week with a Jeep and a Panasonic Toughbook. Uh, following them around at night, um, just watching and uh, watching uh, uh, a lot of male Chinese guys with a lot of money acting as civilians in Tijuana and, and Mexicali. I have a new theory. My new theory of what's going on is that apparently China is now going to be buying crude oil from uh, Mexico and not using petrodollars, not using the, the U.S. dollar, which, which – uh, uh, globally has always been used uh, to, to buy uh, oil. That's why they call it the petrodollar. They're going to use the yuan instead. Um, certainly not going to make the uh, Federal Reserve and the Rothschilds and Rockefellers happy. I mean, look what they did to Libya when Libya didn't want to take the U.S. dollar anymore for, for their oil. And uh, China is also becoming partners with uh, Pexmex, one, one of the major uh, – a gasoline refinery oils oil refinery places in mexico and apparently the china has also put in about a trillion dollars of gold in the uh, mexican central bank which will make the peso a lot stronger maybe even stronger than the dollar which it usually never is and 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 could also lead to uh, an eventual collapse uh, i'll have to be talking about more of that in the future there's a lot of things going on but everything here i'm discussing all falls under the auspices of the power elite what we call the power elite. See, Wright Mills coined the term the power elite with his 1956 book. Now, to start this off, uh, I, I used to like the method. When I, when I was an um, exchange student at the, the University of Salzburg in Austria, I, I was there for a semester, but I took a, a, a literature course in German uh, when I used to know German <laughs> by this professor named Eric Squawa. Squawa blah, blah, he was a writer professor and uh every book we we studied in that class you know he would uh spend he would tell us about the writer's life and what led up to the writing of the book and then get into the book so c wright mills who died in 1962 at the age of 45 was a uh kind of a kind of he was a a, a controversial a professor in sociology. He wasn't your typical milk toast kind of professor. He was a big, tall, strapping guy who wore a leather jacket, rode a Harley to the campus, um, built his own house. Uh, he came from a middle class family and he graduated from Dallas Technical High in 1934. After a year at the uh, Texas A&M University, he transferred to the University of Texas, graduated with a degree in philosophy in 1939. He earned his Ph.D. in sociology at the University of Wisconsin, where he focused his research on social psychology and social theory. After a brief stint of teaching at the University of Maryland, he arrived at Columbia University in 1945 to work at the university's new survey research center and teach sociology. He remained at Columbia until he died in 62. Um, at Columbia, Mills mastered the technique of social research, particularly the skills of conducting interview and doing large surveys, which he used to carry out several projects that his senior colleagues suggested. But Mills was restless. He wanted to use his academic perch to reach outside academia, influence public thinking, and help build a progressive movement. In New York City, he met a widening circle of radicals and rebels like novelist Harvey Swatos, critic Dwight MacDonald, and labor activist J.B.S. Hardman, who expanded Mill's political horizons. He quickly became what today we call a public intellectual, writing essays for progressive and left-wing opinion magazines like The New Republic, The Nation, The New Leader, Partisan Review, Dissent, and Politics, where he criticized America's warfare state and sought ways to investigate grassroots democracy. The country Mills wrote about had overcome the Depression, 
triumph over fascism in the World War II and was in the midst of unprecedented economic boom. The gross national product and the standard of living increased rapidly in the post-war decade. A growing number of American families were able to afford to move to the suburbs, buy homes, install air conditioners, purchase a new con contraption called a television, pay for a new car every few years, take a yearly vacation, and stay at one of these new phenomenons called a motel, and even fly on an airplane. They could send their children to college and save money for a comfortable retirement. This was the 1950s America where everything seemed so perfect. The post-war prosperity was fueled by big government initiatives, a massive national highway building program, huge subsidies and financial aid to expand the college and university system, federal insurance to increase home building and home buying, and most importantly, an immense defense budget. An immense defense budget, because remember, this was the Cold War time. All this government spending boosted employment and put money in people's pockets, stimulating the consumer demand that provided America's business with record profits. Business, political, religious, and academic leaders justified all the government spending as critical to winning the Cold War. Russia, Japan, Germany, and the rest of Europe had been destroyed economically and physically by the war. The United States, in contrast, was the dominant economic and military superpower of the world. American businesses were able to produce goods, cars, cameras, TVs, movies, blue jeans, and soda that would sell at home and all over the world. But most businesses and political leaders warned all this could end unless the United States was ready to stop the spread of communism, especially in Europe and the poor nations of the world. American schools and universities had to train the next generation of skilled workers, corporate managers, school teachers, and scientists, particularly to compete with Russia, which launched the Sputnik satellite in 1957. We even had to be prepared if necessary to fight in a nuclear war with Soviet Union. The vast defense budget, what some called a permanent war economy, paid for expensive new weapon systems, military bases around the world, and millions of Americans, what did they do? Millions of civilians and troops were employed by the Army, the Navy, Marines, Air Force, and private military contractors. At home, the fear of communists and other radicals led to the hysteria called McCarthyism, led by business groups worried about stronger unions and higher taxes, and by politicians who got into office by scaring voters about the red menace taking over public schools, unions, Hollywood, and universities. C. Wright Mills rebelled against this conventional thinking. In his first few years at Columbia, Mills joined a network of academics who provided research to help union leaders understand the major social and economic changes facing their members. A wave of militant strikes across the country after the war and, in, and an increase in union membership gave radicals hope that the labor movement would be in the forefront of progressive change. Mills' ties to the labor movements led to the first of his major books on what he called the main drift of American society. His first book was The New Men of Power, Americans' Labor Lead Leaders, published in 48. When Mills was writing the book, union membership had increased fivefold in the previous decade and represented one-third of non-farm workers. He believed that unions could be a bulwark against America's drift toward war and slump by pushing to convert the war economy to civilian uses, improving workers' incomes and job security, and giving ordinary Americans a voice in government to challenge big business power. And, of course, the right would consider that to be communist leanings. At the core of the new men of power is Mill's survey of 500 leaders. He discovered blue-collar workers' route to the middle class was more likely to occur via better union contracts than by being recruited into the ranks of corporate management. He found that CIO union leaders were more progressive than the AFL counterparts and that many were open to the idea of a third political party based in the labor movement 
and that an astonishing 69% of industrial union leaders believe that the potential for fascism was real a real threat in the United States. Those was particularly impressed with Walter Ruther, who had just been elected president of the union auto workers and other progressive union leaders whom he hoped would move the labor movement left. Mill's next book was called White Collar, The American Middle Classes. That came out in 51. It explored the social conditions of psychology in the growing strata of Americans in the professions of middle management. Living in an urban neighborhoods and suburbs and exemplifying the American way of life that the nation's leaders contrasted with the drab and compliant life in communist Russia. Now, if any of you have seen that, that uh, TV show Mad Men, it's a perfect example of that. Even though Mad Men is more set in the late 50s, early 60s, it's, it has that uh, 1950s uh, middle management, well, not middle management, but white collar uh, New York, uh, you know, office worker kind of thing going on there, and and uh, uh, all all very American, very patriotic for the American way. Um, that was his his third book. In a speech in England, uh, Mills described said this by what he he was getting at. Uh, uh, he coined a phrase called the cheerful robot to decry the unthinking conformity of much of America's middle-class culture. What he said was, we know that men can be turned into robots by chemical means, by physical coercion, as in concentration camps and so on. But we are now confronting a situation more serious than that, a situation in which there are developed human beings who are cheerfully and willingly turn themselves into robots. Um, there's a clip floating around of... Uh, of uh, uh, George Carlin talking about the same thing about how uh, you know they they want people working who are uh, smart enough to to do the job to operate the machines and the computers and and whatever you know uh, but dumb enough not to uh, realize they're being screwed uh, in various uh, ways that they're actually just slaves to the corporate machine. Mills, Mills, C. Wright Mills, believed that such a conformity was an aspect of what he called mass society, a condition of widespread political apathy that allowed business and political leaders to pursue the arms race and the potential for nuclear war without any opposition. You know, you use the, uh, the Red Scare, they're going to bomb us, the nuclear war, and they would get no opposition, right? So uh, what, 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 I, what I'm talking here about here isn't unique today i mean we all know this stuff we but 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 in the, well let's get to his book um in in the, in the 1950s and early 60s okay there were other indications that many americans were coming to question the nationals the nation's moral and psychological condition uh people were starting not you know especially as we get into the 60s they weren't buying uh the lies that that they were being told by the government you know, uh, take, for instance, uh, Catcher in the Rye, uh, which, which was a book about uh, a young kid uh, refusing to conform to um, uh, what the school and society wanted him to be. Uh, Re the movie Rebel Without a Cause was like that. Um, there were like uh, best-selling books of uh, sociology and journalists like uh, William H. White's The Organization Man, Vance Packard's The Hidden Persuaders, and, and his uh, other book, The Status Seekers, they expressed alarm during the height of the Eisenhower administration at the influence of corporate employers, advertisers, and suburban developers in shaping the daily lives of American families. Uh, another example is Arthur Miller's play, Death of the Salesman, that struck a similar chord. You know, uh, uh, the 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 main character in Death of the Salesman. You know, he he bought in to to uh, that American dream of equality, and 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 uh, the government's always right, only you know to find out uh, that the corporation that he worked for uh, left him behind, betrayed him, and didn't give him the American dream that he had bought into. And in other popular uh, uh, mediums, comic books, um, 
magazines and stuff. Uh, Mad Magazine came out at that time questioning stuff. So when the power elite, it was an important book. And well, I mean, let me talk a second here about uh, his fourth book called The Sociological Imagination, uh, which uh, I used in my theory section of my, my, my dissertation in anthropology. Uh, is is an extremely influential book uh, still used uh, by sociologists, anthropologists, uh, people in the social sciences, wherein he, in the sociological ma- imagination, C. Wright Mills called for when we look at people's lives, if, if uh, we're a social scientist studying people or if we're doing a biography or even if we're doing an autobiography, uh, we have to situate the subject into the uh, political climate at the time. And that is the political climate is a driving force in in someone's life, someone's biography. Uh, I'm I'm currently writing a biography of of author Raymond Carver using uh, the sociological imagination uh, uh, theorem method. In that uh, Raymond Carver short stories uh, written written uh, in the late 60s and and much of the 70s were uh, reflected the ec- economic condition at the time, the Nixon and Carter administrations, uh, the, uh, the recession and, deep, and almost depression at the time, the, uh, the oil gas price you know, hike ups and problems back then. Um, and they do reflect that in his stories. So, so that's an example. So we go, as can we see that, that C. Wright Mills, uh, his, his influence spread widely not only through the social sciences, but through uh, uh, literary and, and uh, philosophical areas of academics and non-academics. Now, the power elite, which is the subject of uh, this class here at Revolution Radio University, is what we'll be discussing because in his book, The Power Elite, he challenged the uh, Eisenhower years, the notions that in the United States uh, we were all equal, that our vote counted, that uh, there was no uh, uh, real delineated class system, that uh, the American dream, the American way, manifest destiny, whatever, was the right way, uh, that, that there were just nothing but blue skies up ahead. Now, what, what Mills did in the power elite was uh, pretty much called to the fore, the corporations, the industrial war machine, the rich and powerful and certain bloodlines as to controlling the lives of Americans, uh, that, that, the, that there was no uh, uh, democracy, really, uh, you know, that elections were rigged or, and, uh, and that, um, decisions were being made by the higher ups that seriously affected our lives and that that the uh the cheery brightness and and strangeness or uh, uh, no curiosity called the 1950s was all bogus now when that book came out he was criticized both by both the left and the right that it was ridiculous uh, and 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 it was just uh, hogwash and academic claptrap and it was published in 56, Even that, and that was what, uh, 50 years ago or more. The, this book is still used in classes today um, in sociology, history, political science, anthropology, and philosophy, because what he was talking about then still applies to today, which is why I decided to um, use this book as a focus today. Uh, it's a very good book. You should go out and read it if you're uh, if you're so inclined to do so. Um, the Power Elite was the most radical, controversial, and widely read of Mill's major books. It caused a firestorm in academic and political circles. America has a ruling elite, Mills con- contended, and its most active members, top corporate executives, have little sense of social responsibility. Rather, they work collaborative, collaboratively with top military leaders and their allies in Congress and the White House. Of course, you know, we all know this by then, but really, uh, back then, that this was a radical notion to most people. Most people didn't really uh, 
think about that. The various interest groups that contend for power, it's like farmer organizations, labor unions, big city mayors, and such a whatever, fought over crumbs left over after the big spending decisions. In, in particular, the military budget had already been decided. Most pointed out that the corporate, military, and political elites were not separate spheres, but overlapping groups at the common post of society, say, uh, top corporate executives uh, like uh, Eisenhower Secretary of Defense, who was uh, the former CEO of uh, General Motors, um, his name was Charles Wilson, he was recruited to serve in the cabinet and on numerous committees providing advice to the White House and Congress. Of course, now we see that happening all, all the time today. Uh, retired generals and admirals, which uh, Mill call, Mills called the warlords, went to work for the major defense corporations using their influence to argue for bigger military budgets, new weapon systems, and government contracts for, uh, for new employers, right? Corporate executives and Pentagon leaders lobbied Congress to increase the military budget, pointing out that it would create jobs in defense plants and military bases in their districts. Of course, you know, at this time, you know, we'd, we'd, we had won World War II, uh, quote unquote one. You know, we defeated the Germans, we defeated the Japanese, uh, we had economically destroyed both, and we were uh, using American money to rebuild both. Uh, and then, then, and then we were at the time also in Korea, you know, fighting the communist scare, and with Korea, you know, we were to build more uh, war stuff, the perpetual war. And 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 when you look at what's going on in Europe right now, all these countries, you know, Spain, Greece, Italy, Portugal, they're falling apart economically. Once they do, France. Um, uh, maybe England, but but uh, France and Germany will follow. Now, what would get them out of that? What what has historically gotten countries out of economic collapse? War. We saw it with Germany. We saw it with Italy, and we we've we've seen it before that too during World War One. We go here, Michael Hemmingson, aka Doc H, aka Doctor Hemmingson, aka Worf Poe. AKA at times the heavy mass object. Uh, today on the uh, Art of Dreaming, we are, I'm talking about uh, sociologist C. Wright Mills and his most influential book, The Power Elite, published in 1956, yet, yet uh, still pertinent for today. And it challenged the predominant view that America was a classless society and that all segments of society, such as farmers, workers, uh, middle-class consumers, small and big business owners, et cetera, et cetera, had an equal voice in its democracy. Instead, he described the power structure created by overlapping circles of business, military, and political leaders whose big decisions determine the nation's destiny, including war and peace. Now, when this book came out, the academic and media establishment attacked uh, Mill's caustic critique of what he called the American celebration. He was a lonely voice among academic sociologists, but his book sold well, so suggesting that at least some Americans were not happy with the post-war status quo. His uh, writings eventually uh, struck a chord with a significant segment of American public and with the small but growing radical movement that were on college campuses. Uh, many of Mill's ideas were considered radical in his day, but of course, now they seem, uh, uh, we take it for granted today. I mean, we, we already know all this, right? Especially in the alternative media. But his phrase, the uh, power elite, which was criticized by both conservatives and liberals at that time, is now used widely today in mainstream media. You know, it's always the elite, the cabal, the, uh, the rich, the uh, powerful, the elitists, the elite bankers, the uh, elite military, the elite family bloodlines like the Bushes and the Kennedys and the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and all those good guys, bad guys, good, good and bad guys. Anyway, public opinion today, of course, seems to be swinging in Mill's direction, even though he was uh, attacked as being just uh, too out there back in the 50s when he suggested all this. Even many Americans who uh, don't agree with, uh, say, for instance, uh, Occupy Wall Street's tactics 
or rhetoric, nevertheless share an in indignation uh, at uh, an outrage at corporate profits, uh, Wall Street widening inequality and excessive executive compensation side by side with the epidemic of of, of layoffs and foreclosures and uh, the, the unemployment rate, um, credit card hikes, all that stuff. That 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 the elite are all behind it, and they are, aren't they? Most Americans now recognize that the biggest corporations and the very wealthy have disproportionate political influence. A Pew Research Center survey released. Um, last year in December, found that most Americans, 77%, including a majority, 53% of Republicans, agree that there's too much power in the hands of a few rich people and the corporations. Pew also discovered that 61% of Americans believe that the economic system in this country unfairly favors the wealthy. A significant majority. 57% think that the wealthy people don't pay their fair share of taxes, which seems to be a, uh, a point of contention right now with uh, uh, Mitt Romney's uh, tax uh, returns uh, made made uh, public. Of course, Obama won't make his public. He doesn't make anything public. Now, whether they refer, whether people are referring to the elite as the establishment or the power structure or the top 1%, or whatever you want to call them, it seems that Americans understand that this concentration of power subverts democracy. They see the revolving door among the corporate boardrooms, uh, top military brass in the cabinet, say, exemplified by men like uh, Robert Rubin, Dick Cheney, Colin Powell, Donald Rumsfeld, John Snow, Timothy Geithner, uh, John Bryson, who served with Clinton, Bush, and the Obama administrations. They know that corporate campaign contributions buy access and influence and tilt the political playing field toward big business interest made worse by the Supreme Court's Citizen United ruling in 2010, stating that individuals and corporations can exercise almost unlimited free speech through political donations. The current wave of super PAC dominating our elections funded primarily by millionaires and billionaires, reflects the corruption of democracy by big money. And this is what C. Wright Mills warned us about back in 1956 during the Eisenhower administration, who, by the way, Eisenhower, remember, did warn Kennedy before you know the, the, the power reign switch. He warned Kennedy about the military industrial complex um, of becoming uh, too powerful and of having too much influence over White House policy and social structure. Um, this is what, what this is what uh, C. Wright Mills called the uh, military ascendancy, where we saw see uh, retired generals and admirals, people from the Pentagon moving into big business and into uh, politics. So you say, for instance, uh, you know, even 100 years prior to that, 200, 300 years, when you had, when, when, when countries were ruled by mo monarchies, by kings and stuff, uh, the generals, the top military leaders, that's what they were. They were just military. And when they retired, they retired. The, the mil these ex-military guys didn't uh, become monarchs. They didn't move into the uh, uh, courts and into the uh, political uh, circles of influence, not the way that they do today where, where we see these overlapping things. Ditto could be said with, say, uh, clergy as well. So what I'm going to do here is go through uh, the chapters of the book and just uh, – read some highlights to so get an idea of of what Mills was uh, writing and warning about and how it, it still applies to today. So the first chapter of the Power Elite is called The Higher Circles. And he, uh, uh, most of the first few chapters, he, he discusses uh, the different varieties of the Power Elite, you know, from the corporations 
to the uh, rich families, to the military, and even celebrities. Uh, celebrities back then, and as we see now, uh, have have major influence in uh, uh, the destiny of the country of political policy. I mean, look at Arnold Schwarzenegger becoming uh, mayor of California, or Ronald Reagan uh, becoming uh, governor. Did I say mayor? Arnold Schwarzenegger is governor of California. California, as he said. I am governor of California. And uh, you know, Reagan, um, even right now, we see, you know, uh, what do we hear? Oh, these uh, uh, certain celebrities are coming, are uh, stepping up and supporting Obama. You know, like, uh, um, uh, I can't remember her name, the one in the Avengers, um, whatever. And Jessica Alba is, is, is now out supporting uh, uh, Obama, showing that she's a traitor. And she's so hot, too. She's got what, – what, what did, what did uh, Angela say? She's got the uh, yoga butt. And um, – oh, no, no. That was – well, yeah, I guess Jessica would have a yoga butt. And uh, uh, George Clooney, say, look how, how involved in politics he is. So celebrity is part of that, too. So in – in the first chapter, uh, Mills talks about what he calls the higher circles. And he writes, the powers of ordinary men are circumscribed by the everyday worlds in which they live. Yet even in these rounds of jobs, family, and neighborhood, they often seem driven by forces they can neither understand nor govern. Great changes are beyond their control, but affect their conduct and outlook nonetheless. The very framework of modern society confines them to projects not of their own, but from every side. Such changes now press upon the men and women of the mass society, who accordingly feel that they are without purpose in an epoch of which they are without power. But not all men and women are in this sense ordinary as the means of information and of power are centralized some come to occupy positions in american society from which they can look down upon so to speak and by their decisions mightily affect the everyday world of ordinary people they are not made by their jobs they set up and break down jobs for thousands of others they are not confined by simple family responsibilities they can escape. They may live in many hotels and houses, but they are bound by no one community. And aside here, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, the elite uh, are underground and the elite are on Mars. They're not even bound to this world. That, that's my aside. So back to, to uh, Mills. They need not merely meet the demands of the day and the hour. In some part, they create these demands and cause others to meet them. Whether or not they profess their power, their technical and political experience of it far transcends that of underlying population. What Jacob Barkoff said of great men, most Americans might as well say of the elite. They are not. They are blah, They are all that we are not. Let me repeat that. Of what? Jacob Burkhart says of great men and what Mills says of the elite in society. They are all that we are not. What some uh, actually are now calling the breakaway society or the breakaway culture. Mills goes on. The power elite is composed of men whose positions enable them to transcend the ordinary environment of ordinary men and women. They are in position to make decisions having major consequences. Whether they do or do not make such a decision is less important than the fact that they do occupy such piv pivotal positions. Their failure to act, their failure to make decisions is itself an act that is often of greater consequence than the decisions that they do make, for they are in command of the major hierarchies and organizations of modern society. They rule the big corporations. They run the machinery of the state 
and claim its prerogatives. They direct the military establishment. They occupy the strategic command posts of the social structure in which are now centered the effective means of the power and the wealth and the celebrity which they enjoy. So they have power, wealth, and celebrity. Donald Trump, Barack Obama. The power elite are not ordinary rulers. Advisors and consultants, spokesmen and opinion makers are often the captains of their higher thought and decision. Immediately below the elite are the professional politicians in the middle levels of power in the Congress and in the pressure groups, as well as among the new and old upper class of town and city and region. Mingling with them in curious ways which we shall explore are those professional celebrities who live by being continually displayed, but are never, so long as they remain celebrities, displayed enough. If such celebrities are not at the head of any dominating hierarchy, they do often have the power to distract the attention of the public or afford sensations to the masses, or more directly, to gain the ear of those who do occupy positions of direct power. George Clooney is an example. Uh, Bono, Jessica Alba, more or less unattached as critics of morality and technicians of power, as spokesmen of God and creators of mass sensibility, such celebrities and consultants are part of the immediate scene in which the drama of the elite is enacted. But that drama itself is centered in the command posts of the major institutional hierarchies. The truth about the nature and the power of the elite is not some secret which men of affairs know but will not tell. Such men hold quite various theories about their own roles and the consequence of events and decisions. Often they are uncertain about their roles, and even more often they allow their fears and their hopes to affect their assessment of their own power. No matter how great their actual power, they tend to be less actually aware of it than the resistances of others to its use. Moreover, most American men are of affairs have learned well the rhetoric of public relations, in some cases even to the point of using it when they are alone and thus coming to believe it. The personal awareness of the actors is only one of the several sources one must examine in order to understand the higher circles. Now, he uses the word actors in, in sociology. When we're studying people, uh, you often just, just call them actors because we're all we all have various roles that we act in in society. And so when a sociologist uh, study people, uh, the subjects are actors. Hang on. Let me let uh, let me vet my whistle here. Thanks. Yes. We won't get into the winged giraffe just yet. There is, however, another view. Those who feel even vaguely that a compact and powerful elite of great importance does now prevail in America often base that feeling upon the historical trend of our time. Of course, he's talking about the 1950s here. However, they have felt, for example, the domination of, military, of the military event, and from this they infer that generals and admirals, as well as other men of decision, influenced by them must be enormously powerful. They hear that the Congress has again abdicated to a handful of men decisions clearly related to the issues of war and peace. They know that the bomb was dropped over Japan in the name of the United States of America, although they were at no time consulted about this matter. They feel that they live in a time of this big decisions. They know that they are not making any. Accordingly, as they consider the present as history, they infer that at its center, making decisions or failing to make them, there must be an elite of power. On the one hand, those who share this feeling about big historical events assume that there is an elite and that its power is great. On the other hand, those who listen carefully to the reports of men apparently involved in the great decisions often do not believe that there is an elite whose powers are of decisive consequence. Of course, what he's saying here is, uh, 
you know, for instance, Obama gets up and uh, he acts like his hands are tied about something that happens or, uh, you know, uh, uh, say, say, for instance, the conflict going on right now about uh, uh, Israel wanting to uh, preempt uh, Iran. You know, Obama acts aloof, uh, acts like uh, these are uh, beyond his pay grade. Uh, he, they do everything to deflect uh, the notion that uh, major war decisions are being made by a select few of these elites behind closed doors. Within American society, society, major national power now resides in the economic, the political, and the military domains. Other institutions seem off to the side of modern history and, on occasion, duly subordinated to these. No family is as directly powerful in a nation's of national affairs as any major corporation. No church is as directly powerful in the external biographies of young men in America today as the military establishment. No college is as powerful in the shaping of momentous events as the National Security Council. Religious, educational, and family institutions are not autonomous centers of national power. On the contrary, these decentralized areas are increasingly shaped by the big three, in which development of decisive and immediate consequences now occur. Families and churches and schools adapt to modern life. Governments and armies and corporations shape it. And as they do so, they turn these lesser institutions into means for their ends. Religious institutions provide chaplains to the armed forces where they are used as a means of increasing the effectiveness of its morale to kill. Schools select and train men for their jobs in corporations and their specialized tasks in the armed forces. I should say here, train men and women. Remember the... This book was written in the 50s, so it's a little uh, uh, male centralized. The extended family has, of course, long been broken up by the Industrial Revolution, and now the son and the father are removed from the family by compulsion, if need be, whatever the army of the state sends out the call. Keep in mind the, the draft that was still in effect during the Korean War and, and Vietnam. And the symbols of all these lesser institutions are used to legitimatize the power and the decisions of the big three. The life fate of the modern individual depends not only upon the family into which he has been born or which he enters by marriage, but increasingly upon the corporation in which he spends the most alert hours of his best years, not only upon the school where he, was he or she was educated as a child and adolescent, but also upon the state which touches him throughout his life but only upon the church by which occasion he hears the word of God, but also upon the army to which he is disciplined. I don't know what really he's saying there. Think, for instance, uh, 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 the American the American dream, I guess, 1950s. You, 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 you go to the best school. And uh, maybe before or after school, you serve some time in the army, uh, the Navy, getting some medals and stuff. And you go to the best school get a good job in the corporation. You move your way up. You, you buy the, the house and the wife and the picket fence and the cars and, and you got the American dream. That is the way of the higher circles. Now, as he goes on to the big three, he has a chapter called the chief executives. This is what he says about the chief executives. The corporations are the organized centers of the private property system. The chief executives are the organizers of that system. Hang on, I'm just checking the, the chat. This is Michael Hemmingson returning here to the Art of Dreaming at Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. And we've been talking about C. Wright Mills, the power elite. But before we get back into it, just want to remind uh, you all out there that uh, Revolution Radio here at freedomslips.com is 100% uh, user-supported. User-supported radio, that means we... Uh, don't take ads. We don't take grants. The power elite does not tell us what to uh, say and do, what kind of guests to have on, or even what kind of host to have on. And so we rely on you out there uh, for your uh, support to help us uh, pay the bills. Uh, there's no free energy just yet, so uh, things things 
things uh, cost uh, to keep on keeping on. So if you go over to our landing page at uh, freedomslips.com or revolution-radio.com, however you get there, you'll see a site support button. You can press that. It takes you to PayPal. If you don't like using PayPal, uh, there's a snail mail address there where you could send checks, cash. No, no, don't send cash. Checks, money orders, uh, rubies and diamonds and gold and silver and stuff like that. Uh, and we got a lot of products to, that you can buy. Uh, you can buy uh, ad banner space. You could sponsor uh, a show. Uh, you could go to our YouTube channel, watch the commercials. It brings in a few pennies. Every little bit helps, and we thank you for that. Uh, what else is going on here? Uh, we're talking about some uh, weird news stuff later on. Uh, upcoming shows I'm planning for The Art of Dreaming. Uh, next week, it's either going to be the Spanish and Mexican-American Wars or the legacy of Charles Bukowski. Now, which do you think would be a more interesting show? Do you want to hear about wars in the past, or do you want to hear about Charles Bukowski and hear some of his crazy wild tales? Uh, I think the latter might uh, have a better uh, YouTube count. I don't know. I have to think about it. Anyway, uh, back back to uh, C. Wright Mills, the power elite. He, we were talking about. Uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna go a little more more quicker through this because I think you all get the idea of what he was getting at. You know, there, there's the corporate executives. Uh, you know, uh, we all know what the corporate executives are, right? We have to go through all, all the rigmarole of it. Corporate executives, and there's the warlords. The warlords, uh, well, let's see what Mill says about the warlords. Uh, it says, during the 18th century, observers of historic of the historic scene began to notice a remarkable trend in the division of power at the top of modern society. Civilians coming into authority were able to control men of military violence whose power being budgeted in and neutralized declined. At various times and places, of course, military men had been the servants of civil decision. But the trend which reached its climax in the 19th century and lasted until World War I, seemed then, and still seems now, remarkably simply because it had never been before, had never before happened on such a scale and never before seemed to be firmly grounded. In the 20th century, among the industrialized nations of the world, the great brief vicarious fact of civilian dominance began to falter, and now, after a long peace from the Napoleonic era to World War I, the old march of world history once more asserts itself. All over the world, the warlord is returning. All over the world, reality is defined to his terms. And in America, too, into the political vacuum, the warlords have marched. Alongside the corporate executives and the politicians, the generals and admirals, those uneasy cousins within the American elite have gained and have been given increased power to make and to influence decisions of the greatest consequence. So we've seen that, and that's what the top of the world is. The next is the uh, what he called the military ascendancy. And he writes, since Pearl Harbor, those who command the enlarged means of American violence have come to possess considerable autonomy, as well as a great influence among their political and economic colleagues. Some professional soldiers have stepped out of their military roles into the high realms of American life. Eisenhower would be an example for that time. Others, while remaining soldiers, have influenced by advice, information, and judgment the decisions of men powerful in economic and political matters, as well as in educational and scientific endeavors. Um, wasn't Eisenhower the, the president of Harvard or one major school at one point? In, in and out of uniform, generals and admirals have attempted to sway the opinions of the underlying population lending the weight of their authority openly as well as behind closed door to controversial policies. In many of these controversies, the warlords have gotten their way. In others, they have blocked actions and decisions which they did not favor. In some decisions, they have shared heavily. In others, they have joined issue and lost. But they are now more powerful than they ever been in the history of American elite. They have now more means of exercising power in many areas of American life, which were previously civilian dominated. 
that they now have more connections and they are now operating in a nation whose elite and whose underlying population have accepted what can only be called a military definition of, re of reality. No area of decision has been more influenced by the warlords and by their military metaphysics than that of foreign policy. Once war was considered the business of soldiers, international relations, the concerns of diplomats. But now that war has become seemingly total and seemingly permanent, the free sport of kings has become the forced and interesting business of people, and diplomatic codes of honor between nations have collapsed. Peace is no longer serious. Only war is serious. Every man and every nation is either friend or foe. And the idea of anonymity becomes mechanical, massive, and without genuine passion. When virtually all negotiation aimed at peaceful agreement is likely to be seen as appeasement, if not treason, the active role of the diplomat becomes meaningless. For dip diplomacy becomes merely a prelude to war or an interlude between wars. And in such context, the diplomat is replaced by the warlord. Now, remember previously, uh, diplomats or uh, uh, envoys uh, and uh, even uh, uh, who were the heads of embassies called? Now, ambassadors um, negotiated peace between warring countries. Uh, they don't do that anymore. And as, as Mill says, uh, they've now become. Uh, diplomacy becomes a prelude to war or an interlude between wars uh, rather than diplomacy uh, acting as as a uh, avenue to uh, peace and uh, and um, allegiances and uh, treaties so if anyone wants to call in while I'm, I'm yakking away and want to talk about this this stuff uh, uh, feel free to do so oh, I was going to mention that um, you uh, you uh, you don't have to uh, you don't need to hear us on the internet anymore. You you could actually you could actually call on the telephone. I'm I'm looking for the number and I I, I don't see it. Hang on here. You know, uh, say your iPad is down or your 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 internet's down, uh, or you're uh, you're in a different country or I don't know. You're feeling like God. I gotta listen to some some revolution radio. I've gotta hear what what doom and gloom hijacker has to say, or or what news Jason is crunching, or who Carrie Cassidy is interviewing, or uh, what high intelligence Dr. Hemmingson is discussing. Well, you know, you just call up. You can call. The number is five three zero eight eight one one two one two. That's five three zero eight eight one one two one two. I hope you got a pen. You're writing it down. And then when you get there, you enter code five. Oops, you enter code eight four five three six zero zero two four, and you will be connected to uh, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Because uh, you never need to expect us, because we're already on the phone. So, uh, uh, okay. So we kind of get the gist of what 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 uh, C. Wright Mills was talking about what was going on in the 50s and and how the big elites were stealing the soul of the United States. So the, the obvious question for the reader of the power elite for, for today is, is whether Mill's conclusions apply to uh, contemporary United States. You know, does what he say apply to September 26th of 2012? And uh, my computer's acting up here. Here, well, let's let's look at it this way. Each year, Fortune magazine publishes a list of the 500 leading American companies based on revenues. Say, roughly 30 of the 50 companies that dominated the economy when uh, C. Wright Mills wrote his book, uh, they no longer do, including firms in once seemingly impregnable industries such as uh, steel, food. These were, these were the big Fortune 500 companies back then. So uh, putting it another way, uh, look at the list right now. 
uh, well, we'll take a look, take for instance General Motors. Uh, back in C. Wright Mills' time, General Motors uh, ranked first, uh, Ford second, and Exxon third on the Fortune 500. But the uh, the company immediately following these uh, giants, like uh, Walmart stores, did not even exist at the time that Mills wrote. Indeed, the uh, the idea that uh, of chain real retail stores uh, started by folksy a uh, folksy Arkansas merchant would someday outrank uh, Mobile Oil and General Electric and Chrysler would have would have been uh, unheard of in the 1950s when Mills put his book out. Uh, just as some industries have declined, whole new industries have appeared in the United States since 1956. So, uh, for instance, IBM uh, was uh, number 59 when Mills wrote his book, and uh, it was hardly a computer giant at that time anyway. Uh, there was no Compaq or Intel or, or Apple back then. To illustrate how uh, closed the world of the power elite was, Mills called attention to the fact that one man, Winthrop W. Aldrich, the American ambassador to Great Britain, was the director of four of the top 25 companies in America in, the ni- in 1950. Uh, by contrast, in 1998, only uh, one of those companies, AT&T, was at the very top. Of the other three, like uh, Chase Manhattan, was number 27, Metropolitan Life had fallen to 43, and the New York Central Railroad was never even be found at that time. But anyway, despite these changes in the nature of corporate America, much of what Mills had to say about the corporate elites still applies. It is certainly still the case, for example, that those who run companies are very rich. The gap between what a CEO makes and what a worker makes is extraordinarily high. But there's one difference between the world described by Mills and the world of today that is uh, so striking it can't be passed over. Uh, As odd as it may sound, Mills' understanding of capitalism was not radical enough. Heavily influenced by the sociology of its time, the power elite portrayed corporate executives and organization men who must fit in with with those already at the top. They had to be concerned with managing their impressions as if the appearance of good results were more important than the actuality of them. Mills was disdainful of the idea that leading businessmen were especially uh, competent. The fit survive, he wrote, and fitness means not formal competency. There probably is no such thing for a top executive position, but conformity with the criteria of those who have already succeeded. Now, it may have well been true that in the 1950s, the corporate leaders were not especially inventive. But if so, that was not because they faced relatively new challenges. Say, if you were the head of General Motors in 1956, you knew that American automobile companies dominated your market. The Japanese hadn't gotten into it yet. Uh, The last thing on your mind was the fact that someday cars called Toyotas and Hondas would be your biggest threat. You did not like the union which organized your workers, but if you were smart, you realized that an ever-growing company economy would enable you to trade off high wages for your workers in return for labor market stability. Smaller companies that supplied you with parts were dependent on you for orders. Each year you wanted to outsell, say, Ford and Chrysler, and yet you worked with them to create an elaborate set of signals so that they would not undercut your prices and you would not undercut theirs. Whatever your market share was in 1956, in other words, you could be fairly sure that it would be the same in 1957. So why rock the boat? It made perfect sense for building, budding executives to do what C. Wright Mills argued that they do. Assume that the best way to get ahead was to get along and go along. In other words, corporate conformity. Very little of this picture remains accurate at the end of the 20th century, though. Union membership as a percentage of the total workforce has declined dramatically. And while this means that companies can pay their workers less, for example, Walmart, which doesn't have unions and doesn't pay anyone over what, seven or $8 an hour. It also means that they cannot expect to invest much in the training of their workers on the assumption that these workers will remain with the company for most of their lives. Uh, Meaning, uh, you know, 
back in the fifties, you know, you you got a good job in, in a company, uh it was expected that you'd stay with that job. Maybe you'd move up, maybe not too high, middle management or whatever, and you retire from that company. You don't uh go uh jumping jobs as much as we see today. Um foreign competition, uh, which was once negligible, is now the rule of thumb for most American companies leading many of them to move parts of their companies overseas and to create their own global marketing arrangements. Uh, So uh, uh, helplines, tech uh, every every time you call uh, uh, some sort of tech line or your credit card company or something, you know, you get someone on the other line with uh, uh, Hindu or uh, uh, accent, Turkish accent. I don't know. We, we, We all know what's going on there. America's fastest growing industries can be found in the field of high technology, which is something that Mills did not anticipate in the 50s. Uh, Often dominated by self-made men, another phenomenon about which Mills was doubtful. Uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg could be an example of this. Um, These firms are ruthlessly competitive, which upsets any possibility of forming gentlemen's agreements to control prices. Indeed, Among internet companies, the idea is to provide the product with no price whatsoever is for freeing the hopes of winning future customer loyalty. Um, Obviously, C. Wright Mills did not see in the future the the, uh, internet boom. Companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, offering a product for free, yet... uh, generating revenue in a different way, creating a whole different sorts of corporate marketplaces and, 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 and structure. Uh, we have seen in the whole Silicon Valley uh, dot com booms of, uh, you know, people in their late teens or early 20s all of a sudden becoming CEOs and uh, corporate executives uh, uh, top of the game without having you know, done the usual thing of climbing the ladder or or, or uh, being in the trenches for many years. Uh, you know, you got, uh, you've had these guys uh, like Mark Zuckerberg. You know, all of a sudden, they're uh, they've got this this power and they're uh, they approach things differently than the way it has been before. And so, you know, we've seen how the government now has co-opted how the power elite has infiltrated and co-opted Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and eBay and PayPal and all, all these things that uh, represented the freedom of the internet, but now have uh, been succumbed to the power elite. So these radical changes in competitive dynamics in American capitalism have important implications for any effort to characterize the power elite of today. C. Wright Mills was a translator and interpreter of the German sociologist Max Weber, and he borrowed from Weber the idea that a heavily bureaucratized society would also be stable and a stable and conservative society. Only in a society which changes relatively little is it possible for an elite to have power in the first place. For if events change radically, then it tends to be the events controlling the people rather than the people controlling the events. There can be little doubt that those who hold the highest position in America's corporate hierarchy remain, as they did back in the 50s, the most powerful Americans. But not even they can control rapid technological transformations, intense global competition, and ever-changing consumer tastes. American capitalism is simply too dynamic to be controlled for very long by any one. Maybe an example of this could be the new iPhone 5. I, I was at a store the other day and saw they were selling iPhone 4s for 95 cents, where I paid a couple hundred for my iPhone 4 just back in April. How quickly obsolete these things become. And that's, that's, that's the way of the uh, technological booms, the dot-com companies, that within six months, everything changes. Within six months, companies rise and fall. Within six months, a kid in a a dorm room at Stanford or Harvard 
will suddenly become a CEO of a great and powerful internet company. This is this never happened in, in uh, American capitalism before. So things are changing. And the power elite are trying to catch up on that. I just saw found an article that is an example of one of the members of the power elite advocating conformity of the old ways. And this article is from George Soros. I'm going to uh, I'm going to put that in the chat. I'm going to put the link in the chat room. Hang on. Uh, it's coming from FT.com. I have no idea. I think that's Financial Times. It's an interesting article written by George Soros and Fazal Hassan Abed. Probably George Soros uh, dictated it and Fazal wrote it out and cleaned it up. So it's an opinion piece titled Rule of Law Can Rid the World of Poverty. Now, as I read through this article by Soros, I don't need to point out how much BS is and lies is going through here. It's going to be obvious. And this article just came out today. So Soros writes, poverty is on the retreat. Yeah. Say that to the people in Spain who are digging through trash cans. Through uh, Greece, these countries falling apart. Uh, the uh, amount of people in the United States on food stamps, uh, on welfare, uh, who can't get jobs or, or have degrees and are flipping hamburgers. Soros is saying, poverty is on the retreat. Despite the global economic downturn, the World Bank and UN reported this year that the number of people living in extreme poverty has dropped in every region of the world for the first time since record-keeping began. Hang on. I need to, I need to kick back while I read this because this is absolutely ridiculous. Okay, so, no... Soros is saying, though progress on the UN's Millennium Development Goals have been uneven, we should be heartened that we have already reached, three years before the target date of 2015, the first of these eight goals, that of having the number of people still living on less than a dollar a day. However, we risk allowing these gains to come undone if we fail to strengthen the rule of law in developing countries. Without basic legal empowerment, the poor live on an uncertain existence in fear of deprivation, displacement, and disposition. A juvenile is wrongfully detained and loses time in school. Village land is damaged by mining companies without compensation. An illiterate widow is denied the inheritance she is entitled to and is forced on the streets with her children. By what means can individuals and communities protect their rights in daily life? Tens of millions of people live without a legal form of identity, such as a birth certificate. This identity is the cornerstone of justice. Without it, one may be denied opportunities to overcome poverty, including access to immunizations, school, land deeds, and welfare. One of the first MDG 2.0 targets, therefore, should be reducing statelessness and providing universal legal identity. The enactment and enforcement of legislation ensuring every citizen has universal access to a documented legal identity and is registered at birth. The legislation is not enough, which is why the second and third targets should concern awareness and access. In developed countries, even those accused of heinous crimes are apprised of their legal rights, and rightfully so. Yet the vast majority of people living in poverty do not even know their rights. Governments must implement concrete measures or enable civil society to do so, making sure the poor are fully aware of rights under the law. The targets must include safeguards and regulations to ensure that everybody, regardless of background or circumstances, has full access to formal justice system. The formal justice system. Special attention also be given to women as well as to vulnerable groups such as the landless, slum dwellers, sex workers, pre-trial prisoners and juvenile offenders. In many places, laws exist on paper to protect the vulnerable from exploitation, yet informal norms 
Informal norms and institutions hold sway, and all too often, these norms and institutions work against the poor and vulnerable, women especially. Where the, legal, where the formal legal system is itself corrupt, there should also be mechanisms such as alternative dispute resolution which work to provide justice outside the courts. These need not only be costly solutions. We have already seen how they might work in places such as Bangladesh, where civil society organizations like BRAC have strengthened the legal rights of the poor by training thousands of barefoot lawyers in poor communities. Events in Tahir Square and beyond have sparked optimism about global democratic resurgence. But at the same time, there is fear of instability and lawlessness. Let us not forget that in 2015, one billion people will still be living in extreme pro poverty. A hard road still lies ahead. Strengthening the rule of law is more important than ever. A legally empowered citizenry is both the guarantor and lifeblood of democracy. Poverty will only be defeated when the law works for everyone. Now that's coming from George Soros. So what is what is what is Soros saying? He's saying uh uh, one one of the first targets of of uh, the UN's Millennium Development Goal is reducing statelessness and providing universal legal identity. He says the enactment and enforcement of legislation ensuring every citizen has universal access to documented legal identity and is registered at birth birth certificate. Now, as many of us now know, this identity, the straw man, the birth certificate, is a means of generating money for the state and country. That by having these identities, they then become collateral for the country they're born in, United States, Mexico, Canada, England, Greece. Bangladesh, they become collateral for these countries to borrow money against from Federal Reserve, central banks, people who are printing up the money. As we know, it's been happening in England and Canada and the United States and so on. We, the people, equal money. We, our work, our life's work is worth a certain amount to the nation to which we belong to. Sean David Martin has talked about this quite a bit. If you look on the lower left-hand side of your birth certificate, real tiny letters. You probably need a magnifying glass, probably covered in ink, but you'll see it. You'll you'll see it. it'll say that it's a banknote, and somewhere else you'll see numbers for it. The stock certificate, and our birth certificates are traded every day on the stock market. So what Soros is advocating here is to get all these undocumented people documented, get their legal identities, get their straw man registered so the straw man could start generating more money for the power elite. Now certainly uh, George Soros is one of what C. Wright Mills called the power elite. He's an extremely rich billionaire and has his fingers in politics and military decisions. It's an interesting uh, little opinion piece he wrote there, basically uh, calling for uh, all of us to be identified. So there will be the our set of state IDs and driver's license. We're going to have the uh, national ID, uh, similar to I suppose uh, uh, passports, the passport card, for instance, uh, to now travel to Mexico and Canada and back. Uh, U.S. citizens don't need, you don't need your passport book anymore, you know, for them to stamp or whatever. Uh, you can now just get the passport card. It's just like a, similar to your driver's license. It's a, it's a hard plastic uh, ID, you know, it just says United States of America and all that stuff. It's got your magnetized strip that has all your information. So that's what we're heading to. That's what the power elite want. 
So if we look at uh, uh, what is now going on over in Europe, we can even look at what's going on uh, at still in the Middle East. Like I said, uh, there's been a bunch of bombings today in Damascus you know, that by the rebels, the rebels who are backed by the United States and Britain and the and Israel is going to be uh, leading up to the big war that the, the power elite, the cabal wants with, with Iran, which most likely will spread quickly to other countries, somewhere that we saw like in World War One and two, and eventually lead to probably one huge global conflict. But let's look at uh, one of the one of the one of the reasons why some of this will happen is, of course, uh, the failing economy. So at the beginning of the show, I was talking about some stuff that was going on in Spain and Greece. So let's look at that a little bit more. Um, let's look at the, the protests going on in Greece. Pull up this story coming from the Associated Press. Greek protest turns violent during general strike. Europe's fragile financial claim was shattered today, today, Wednesday, uh, as investors worried that violent anti-austerity protests in Greece and Spain, in Spain's debt trouble showed that the region still cannot get a grip on its financial crises and stabilize its common currency, the euro. Like I was saying, the euro is probably going to crash. Uh, for a while now, people said uh, uh, financial predictors and soothsayers and doom and gloomers all alike have been predicting that the euro will probably crash in October or November. Probably wait to crash it after the elections because because the... Uh, the euro crashes, the dollar is going to follow. So anyway, back to the article. Uh, police fire tear gas at rioters hurling gasoline bombs and chunks of marble Wednesday during Greece's largest anti-austerity demonstration in six months. Part of a 24-hour general strike that was a test for the nearly four-month-old coalition government and the new spending cuts it plans to push through. Uh, austerity, you know, this is a, these are anti-austerity protests. Austerity and the uh, European nations that are in uh, financial strife, you know, is uh, uh, cutting jobs, cutting benefits, cutting, uh, uh, just cutting, 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 trying to balance their budgets. That's their austerity. The brief but intense clashes by a couple of hundred rioters participating in the demonstration of more than 50,000 people came a day after an anti-austerity protest rocked the Spanish capital, Madrid. Hundreds of Spanish anti-austerity protesters gathered again on Wednesday, ending near Parliament in Madrid amid heavy presence of the police. In Tuesday's protest, police arrested 38 people and 64 were injured. Spain's central bank warned Wednesday the country's economy continues to shrink significantly, sending Spanish stock index tumbling and its borrowing costs rising. Across Europe, stock markets fell as well. Germany's DAX dropped 2%, while the CAC40 in France fell 2.4%, and Britain's FTSE 100 slid 1.4%. The euro was also hit down a further 0.3% at $1.26. Let me see what the euro is trading for. Uh, let's go over to money. What the euro is against the dollar here. Just out of curiosity. Like, for instance, I know right now that the, uh, the British pound is... Is that a good exchange rate with the with the dollar? Well, at least in, in British terms. Say, for instance, I when I get uh, paid by royalties by my British publisher, uh, 
uh, say, uh, you know, if they send me uh, uh, 750 pounds or something, uh, uh, usually it's uh, almost almost uh, $2,000, actually, uh, when it comes out to be. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's see. One euro to the dollar right now is trading for one euro. Yeah. Like I said, a dollar 28 cents. Uh, hmm. I remember the euro being ahead and the euro is dropped. Okay. Back to this, back to what I was our, back to the Greek, back to the Greeks. Beware of Greeks bearing gifts. The terminal Wednesday ended weeks of relative calm and optimism among investors that Europe and the 17 countries that use the euro might have turned a corner. Markets have been breathing easier since the European Central Bank said earlier this month it would buy unlimited amounts of government bonds to help countries with their debts. Okay, so the European Central Bank is buying up bonds, basically buying up the countries. Uh, The move by the uh, ECB helped lower borrowing costs for indebted governments from levels that only two months ago threatened to bankrupt Spain and Italy. Stocks also rose. Media speculation about the timing and cost of a Eurozone breakup or a departure by troubled Greece faded. However, the economic reality in Europe remained dire. Several countries have had to impose harsh new spending cuts, tax rises, and economic reforms to meet European deficit targets, and in Greece's case, to continue getting vital aid. The austerity has hit the country's populations with cut wages and axed services and left the economic struggling through recessions as reduced government spending has undermined growth. Spain has struggled for months to convince investors that it can handle its debts. The government is to unveil an austere 2013 draft budget and new economic reforms on uh, tomorrow. Many believe they could be a precursor to a request for financial help from the European Central Bank. Of course, isn't the European Central Bank run by the Rothschilds? The government has already introduced 65 billion euros in austerity measures designed to bring down its deficit. The country is suffering its second second recession in three years with a predicted 1.5% economic contraction in 2012 and has 25% underemployment. Wow. 25% unemployment in in Spain. That is huge. The Bank of Spain warned Wednesday the recession could be deeper. Spain has come under pressure to tap the ECB bond buying program that has been partly designed to keep a lid on the country's borrowing cost. So far, the government has been reluctant to ask for help for fear of the conditions that may be attached. Okay, so we see that things are just pretty much going for crap in Spain and Greece, and it'll be a domino effect. Uh, other countries are, are going to follow. Um, for instance, let's like like Germany. Uh, let's look at, at uh, Chancellor Andre, Angela Merkel of Germany, who. Uh, some in the conspiracy theory circles say she's uh, actually the daughter of Adolf Hitler, which would make her a Rothschild. Since Hitler was a secret Rothschild. Uh, that his uh, mother worked in the Rothschild castle and had sex with the head Rothschild dude, and therefore Hitler, being a Rothschild of that bloodline, uh, rose to power. In that effect. Anyway, who knows if she is or is not Adolf's daughter. But Angela Merkel says Europe must stay the course with painful reform. Angela Merkel, it looks like we got a phone call here. Bring in the phone call. Who's calling? Who? What's your name? Where are you from? Minnesota. Hello? Hello? Yes? You're on Revolution Radio? That's for Angela Merkel. Uh, you need to I turn your radio down. I didn't have no question that I was trying to get to where I was trying to want it to be. Okay, thanks for calling in. All right. 
<laughs> okay, Angela Merkel issued a blunt warning to Germany's ailing Eurozone neighbors yesterday, telling them that pressing ahead with painful reforms and tough budget policies was the only way of resolving Europe's intractable and deeping economic crises. Oh, what happened to my computer screen? Well, that's what happens when you're up in Seattle and all that stuff. I am up in Seattle. Duh, Seattle. See, I don't even know where I'm at. I'm up in Portland, Pacific Northwest. Okay, obviously my brain's going to mush. Anyway, so the Chancellor made her remarks in a speech to the Federation of German Industries on another day of turmoil in the currency bloc. The Spanish government faced mass anti-austerity protests in Madrid, while Greece was reported to be billions of euro off track in meeting the terms of the bailout. Meanwhile, the ratings agency Standard & Poor's once again highlighted the grim state of the EU economy, forecasting that the Eurozone would not return to growth until at least 2014. Against such a gloomy backdrop, Ms. Merkel insisted, We need to take a deep breath to overcome this crisis. We must make the efforts that will allow Europe to emerge from the crisis stronger than it went in. The German leader conceded, Okay, we got another caller here. Hello, who's calling? What's your name? What you want? SJ. Hey, SJ, what's going on? Well, I was—I want to put in my vote for Bukowski. Uh, yeah, I could—I could do the uh, the uh, legacy of Bukowski next week. Oh, well, he like was a, amazing. It'd be like a, you know, a literature course or something like that. Well, he was important at the time because so many people were getting involved with the sexual revolution, so-called. And uh, Bukowski was a person who gave uh, perspective and balance to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, he had that weekly column in the uh, L.A. Free Press. It was great. And uh, and another one. What was after the L.A. Free Press? Uh, L.A. There were two well, two 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 papers. They were run by the same guy. Oh God, yeah. What is the name? You know, it's famous for the period, right? Yeah, yeah. Um. Jeez, um, I'll, I'll it eludes me it. right at the moment. But his stories were, uh, you'd be reading one, and just when you thought it was hitting for sex, sexy, it'd, it'd slide into ironic, right? <laughs> right. And I love that part about him. Uh, as far as your show tonight, you're going guns, great guns. Go for it. Oh, I'm almost There's over with. Uh, my, my, my point here with... Uh, the uh, big collapse in, in Europe is that probably the only way they're going to get out of it is a war. Well, it's the convenient way for them to pull it off. It gives great profits to the gun runners and right. the gun producers. You know, well, it's good for big business. That's the big problem. We learned a long time ago to, how to turn people into money, and that's when it got ugly. Right, and, and as we saw how Germany pulled itself out was through the war machine. Uh, Italy did the same with, with Mussolini. Uh, I don't know who they would fight. I mean, they're going to fight each other again, or maybe maybe they'll fight us or something, you know? Well, they can drop it down into martial law and fight their own citizenry. Uh, they certainly have adequate uh, access to mercenaries of all sorts, uh, certainly foreign nationals as well, apparently. So what did you think about uh, the foreign troops on the Mexican border? get any new information on that uh i was talking about it earlier i'm oh, sorry i missed it uh, my my theory at the point right now is that we'll see mexico uh is going to start selling crude oil to china uh, right. and not take the dollar the petrodollar they're going to accept the yuan the chinese yuan well when they do that like uh when saddam threatened to do that or anyone else recently what happens is they kill whoever is running the country and uh, basically substitute a military takeover. Right. Like Iraq. Like Iraq. They did it with yeah. Libya because Gaddafi yep. was going to not accept the petrodollar. So my, my theory now is, you know, because people were always like, well, they're going to invade, what are they doing? Is maybe they're there to protect the oil wells. Possibility. Possibility. Well, you know, China is a big player. They certainly own a huge amount of the debt of our debt society.